am more than excited to introduce one of our very own alums, Rochelle Oliver, who is an island girl just like me. Eh, eh. I won't hold it against her that she's from Jamaica. <laughs> Everybody can be from Grenada and St. Kitts, which is where my family is from. But this young lady is all about being unapologetically Caribbean and is the managing editor at Island and Spice magazine. If you are not familiar with her, please Google her. Visit her website, islandandspice.com. I did, and it's fire. Learn about ITAL food. If you don't know what ITAL is, I-T-A-L, Google it, look it up, go to her website. She explains it. And if you don't know who Paula Madison is, you should, because she's one of the greats and the giants of which I now stand on. And when I think about her childhood in Harlem, Rochelle, great job. If you're not familiar with food journalism, you are in for a treat. Without further ado, welcome Rochelle Oliver. Oh, thank you so much, Nikki, for that wonderful, wonderful welcome. Um, I'm so excited um, to be here today. Um, the Emma Boa Bowen Foundation um, has been so pivotal to my you know, career and my upbringing, really. And so it's really amazing to be here with my EBF family. Um, and uh, Tina Perry, thank you for reminding us that even during the pandemic, um, when we're so far apart from each other that we can still lean on one another for support and to embrace this lemonade moment with intention. I just love that. And so I um, want to start talking about uh, food journalism. And I'm going to expand today's conversation. Um, and I titled it uh, Food Journalism and How to Turn Your Side Hustle into a Full-Time Career. So hopefully we'll be able to hit on a lot of things for, for, for folks out there. Now, um, I didn't go into journalism wanting to write about food. Um, as a matter of fact, it was my dream to be an editor of this big New York City magazine on Broadway. And my goal was to just connect with young women and um, give people um, a, a content that left them feeling as if they weren't alone in this world. Um, but uh, you know, my career did take a lot of twists and turns and it was really easy to get discouraged, but I persevered and I managed to achieve my dreams. So today I wanna give you an idea of what food journalism is and explain to you how I ended up going from the New York Times where I was a breaking news editor to owning my own publication. I also wanna share with you three tips on how to expect the unexpected and how that can be your power move. Lastly, I wanna open it up to questions. I wanna give you guys a lot of time to ask questions, whether it's about food journalism or trying to navigate your career or how you can turn your side hustle into a full-time career. So what does food journalism even mean? Food journalism is relatively a new term. Uh, in the beginning, um, it was called food writing, and a lot of the emphasis was on writing about recipes and really just focusing on the technical elements of food. But journalists are beginning to look at food as a place to have a deeper conversation, a deeper conversation about culture, about politics, immigration, and even relationships. So just a quick example, um, you know, for folks out there to get us all up to speed, I'm sure many of you are aware of the uh, conversation about Goya CEO praising Trump. Um, this can be a food journalism story because some of the same folks who are upset about some of the policies, about children being locked in cages, also grew up with Goya being a household product. So Goya seasonings and other products that made them feel safe is now in conflict with a lot of their other views. So in this case, a food narrative that conflicted with their political beliefs is how a food story can become news and essentially food journalism. That's just one example. But I wanna go in to show you what I've done into food journal with food journalism and a way to kind of navigate it and really uh, hone this area and make it my own. 
Um, and so as editor and founder of Island and Spice magazine, I got to direct a conversation that focuses on sharing stories about people, the things that matter to them, and to discuss um, how history played a role in shaping who they are today. In more ways than one, I have managed to achieve my goals that I had set out from the very beginning. So I'm gonna do two things with you. Can we start sending you questions for the Q&A portion? Um, yeah, if you wanna go ahead, if I end up forgetting some of those key questions, um, just remind me at the end and then I'll just try to, uh, you know, go back to them. Um, but be before even those questions come in, let me go ahead and share you guys, share with you guys um, some of the examples as we talk through it. I am going to share with you a Google Doc, okay? Um, which if for some reason we're having technical difficulties, you can follow along on the Google Doc. It also has some helpful tips. Don't go too far ahead because then um, you, you might uh, kill the story a little bit. <laughs> so um, let me go to a share link here. Let me make sure I copy link. Make sure I get you guys the right one. Okay, so there's a Google Doc link, but um, you guys don't need to touch it really if you don't want to, because I'm going to step you through through the share screen option. So, um, there we go. So what you're seeing on the right of the screen is uh, one of the pieces here. The one that um, Jody was, uh, Nikki was so so nice to mention um, earlier. Chopsticks, forks, and knives, the inequality at my dinner table. Um, for this piece, what we were able to do was um, speak with Paula Madison, who had the pleasure of, of speaking with you guys at Emma Bowen earlier conference. But um, we talked to her about um, growing up in Harlem um, and trying to navigate, here it is, Paula Madison, a former media executive, writes about growing up as a Black, Chinese, and Jamaican-American in Harlem during the 1960s and how she navigated racism with flatware in her fist at the young age of 10. This is a new column that we launched called Strained, where we allow people to write about their food legacies and how they've been interrupted. We also have um, Oguava My Guava, where we talk about how locally grown guavas almost disappeared under the pressure of commercial hybrids, but, and how a Cuban farmer in Miami is working to bring back, bring back the tradition of locally grown guavas. So a story like this, we're talking about culture, we're talking about history and how that history was nearly erased uh, under the pressure of um, economics, uh, globalization. So it's another example of food journalism. Uh, for this one, A Taste of Home, we go to New Orleans where we speak with um, St. Lucian celebrity chef. You guys might know her from um, some of these top chef competitions. She's an award-winning chef in, uh, in New Orleans who chose to start cooking with her own Caribbean rums. And you know, normally you're more familiar with people cooking with wines, which is a very European thing to do, obviously became a global thing to do. But why aren't we cooking with, with Caribbean rums? These Caribbean rums are, are, it's part of our heritage as Africans and as Caribbean people. So here she is embracing it and making amazing food. Again, we're bringing together culture, we're bringing together history, and we're bringing together wonderful stories about food. Nikki also mentioned this story, Faithfully in Pursuit of Aital, where it's a Rastafarian chef who's on a mission to show the positive potential of ital. For those of you who don't know, ital is a plant-based way of eating that is somewhat similar to um, how you eat if you're a person of the Jewish faith, if you um, are Orthodox Jew and um, eat kosher. Um, this is an African-based culture that doesn't use salt, doesn't use sugar, and completely eats natural food from the land. Um, the Rebirth of Caribbean Cuisine is another uh, story where we went to the island of Barbados to talk to a chef about claiming his own foods. Um, he chose to toss out 
black pepper and a lot of other peppers and cook exclusively with scotch bonnet pepper, again, to embrace his culture and his heritage. And so with, these are all examples of what Island and Spice is doing um, and making an effort to move the conversation forward um, when it comes to stories about food, stories about culture. And often what's really, what's really um, amazing when talking about food journalism stories that you have an opportunity to kind of correct the cultural narrative that has often been told by the others, uh, meaning people who are not of your, your culture or your race. So it's been an amazing opportunity to do that. And um, another example of food journalism, you guys are probably all familiar with Anthony Bourdain. He's a great example of someone who was able to go out there and really show people, um, give people deep insights about RIP, I know, <laughs> give people great insights uh, about how people live and who they are through the perspective of food. So there's a question, how is Island and Spice recognized issues like food scarcity, food scarcity in low income or minority communities? That is a great question. Um, food scarcity and low income minority communities. Um, and, and I would like to kind of rephrase that and almost just say um, like underrepresented uh, communities that are underrepresented. Uh, often a lot of our food narratives, we're talking about rum, for example, is not really coveted as a high end um, food. Um, we also highlighted, uh, I can go ahead and show this to you. Um, let me get back here. So here's the cover, another, um, so we, here we have some Haitian dishes and a Haitian chef. The anatomy of heat is a great example of bringing attention to ingredients that don't get mainstream play all that often. Um, and by shining a light on these ingredients that are often used in, uh, I guess, non-mainstream foods, I think we are shining a light on those chefs who are working hard every day, making great foods that might not be getting appreciated. So we try to give a, a space and platform for those chefs who are not mainstream to be appreciated with the same respect, quality, attention that you would see from the New York Times or um, like Eater and uh, Vice.com, Washington Post is another wonderful um, food publication. Okay, so there we go, we're, we're, we're back at it. And so um, through this, I've been able to give a platform for chefs and cooks for an opportunity to be seen and heard. Um, and it's just that even though this path is a little bit different than maybe the one I had originally in, intended, um, there are a lot of commonalities because I'm still able to talk about food and give people connection. Um, there's a plus in covering food journalism because I get a lot more desserts and cocktails along the way. So there's some great perks to it. There are some links to, just to give you guys some other examples of food journalism. You're welcome, Nicolette. Um, so the truth is, I'm going to pivot here and talk about the truth of that food journalism isn't necessarily for everybody. Um, the career path you might have in mind might be a little different, but I want to talk to you about how to make your own path and where there seems to be no viable way, I wanna let you know that there in fact is a way. So let's go to our rules. And this is uh, how we turn our side hustle into a career. Rule number one, don't get comfortable and always have a side hustle. My career started in Miami, Florida. I was fresh out of the Emma Bowen Foundation program. I was finishing my last year in college and I already had five paid internships under my belt. Uh, but here's the thing, I was graduating into a recession and into a housing crisis. Jobs, especially the newsroom jobs were disappearing. Uh, jobs I had already lined up, they were placed on hold and then completely canceled out. 
So I was terrified that I was never going to get a job. I was terrified that all this hard work I had done was going to just dissolve. Um, so things weren't looking up. And I'm sure that might sound familiar to a lot of you. But luckily, six months before I graduated, I spotted this part-time job listed for an editor online. Um, I applied and seriously, like five minutes later, I got a call back. Um, I went in, did my interview, and they wanted to hire me on the spot. There was one hitch though. Uh, the job had accidentally listed uh, the position as part-time. In fact, it was full-time. I was still in school. So they wanted me enough, luckily, um, that they hired me and they said, we're gonna work with your schedule. And so it seemed just like that. I was an associate editor for Tribune where I ran my own team of reporters and photographers. I was covering food, drink, and nightlife in the area of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach County. That same month that we launched the site, I was turning 21. So there was a moment where we didn't even know if I could cover drinks because legally it might've been an issue. So the scary thing was at that time, I didn't really imagine that I would be covering food. I hadn't really done it before, but it was a job and I'm an EBF alum. So I gave it my all. Um, while a lot of folks want to focus on, I got a job moment, you know, like, hey, I got the job. Let's, let's, let's hype that up. The matchup happened when really no one was looking. During those grueling times when things weren't easy. During college, I decided to write about anything and everything and blindly submitted articles to magazines and newspapers. I built contacts and asked folks to review my work. This was my side hustle. This was where I grew the most and this is where I made a lot of mistakes while no one was looking. So when it came time to perform, I was ready. And so then I wanna go to rule number two, expect the unexpected. Remember how I was just talking about this big break out of college? Well, that job ended up laying the foundation of my career. As associate editor, I became the entertainment correspondent for the CW News in a top 50 market. I ended up overseeing content that would publish across two platforms, two print platforms, two websites, and on air, on television, broadcast. Then in about three years, Tribune went into bankruptcy. There were cost cuts. I was one of those cost cuts. What most, most folks didn't know was that while I was doing the work in the limelight, I was honing more skills on the side. I was teaching myself Photoshop. I was a columnist for a non-compete weekly newspaper. So when times got tough, yeah, I was pissed off, but I wasn't empty handed. I kept busy, which led to another job. It wasn't as glorious and it was slightly off brand because I was a staff reporter for a communications department for the law school, give it up for the U. But, and even when I was there, I didn't sit back and relax. I kept my side hustle going because I knew I wanted to be back in the journalism world. So I leaned into my TV skills that I learned while I was an intern with EBF working for PAX TV. I started producing commercials. I actually ended up producing a commercial for Hershey's through current TV, which is now known as Al Jazeera. So when my department decided to go in another direction, and let go of team members again, I was fine. I launched a production company and that led to the development of a PSA about racism uh, following the killing of Trayvon Martin. Again, my side hustle springboarded me into a next career move. I became a guest contributor on cable ne networks, CNN, MSNBC, talking about race, race relations in America. This got more attention shortly after the New York Times called. This takes me to rule number three, always bet on yourself. There's this idea that when you get your job and you work your way up, that everything's gonna work out. Yeah, that does happen, but that 
didn't happen into my, in my case. I graduated into a rough market. So that option wasn't in, on the table for me. If I had waited for someone to give me a chance, I would never have made it to the Times. I would have never written that article on beef patties that led me back to where I am today. So when you have extra time, spend it on expanding your knowledge base. When you have extra money, spend it on your future business, even if you don't know what that business is yet. When my relationship with the university had ended, ended I actually had a good amount of cash saved up. I decided I could either go back to school, I could buy a house, or I could start my own business. The point isn't about what choice I ended up making, but rather about giving yourself the room to have choices in the first place. So lastly, I want to give one more point before opening it up. A bonus rule. Trust the process, not the problem. I'm sure the lot, a lot of the conversations today and yesterday, and you'll have them again tomorrow, kind of tells you what you should do, what you should not do. What works for one person might not work for you, but that's okay. Life's a journey that we process day by day and moment by moment. So you won't always get it right. And not only is that okay, it's necessary for growth. So don't get sidetracked when things don't go right. That's the process. Trust it and don't worry about the problems. So I just wanna go ahead and open it up if, to, um, thank you, Jason. Trust the process, not the problem. Yep. So if you guys have um, questions, I noticed there were a few coming, coming in. You could talk more about food journalism. Um, and the, the, I saw some, some interesting questions going through. Um, thank you, Tiffany. Okay, if anybody asks questions earlier, if they can go ahead and drop them in one more time. Okay, so Jody asked, what was it like transitioning directly from college to an editor management role? How did it feel being in charge of people with more work experience than you? That's a very good question. Um, well, uh, one of the things I had done when I was in college, one of our classes that we held was to create our own publication. So I was one of the managing editors of that. And we ended up having a team of 20, uh, 20 members. And even after the class, we chose to continue the magazine. So we had this bilingual magazine running out of Miami on our own. And um, we were had it, uh, members from English speaking members and also uh, folks writing from out of Brazil. And so that was, I was experiencing running a kind of like the newsroom setting. But yes, it was very difficult being the youngest person in an industry that is predominantly run by uh, women in their 60s and men in their 60s who do not look like me. Um, and so one of the things I did was to find a way to even the playing field. I listened a lot um, when people uh, gave me a kind of I understood that they were, in, they were upset that someone young was coming in with a title that they also shared. But what I chose to do was to approach the stories from a point of strength, a point of something where I was familiar. I really couldn't talk about the technical aspects of, I don't know, some sort of foie gras or something. No, I, I couldn't talk about that at 21. But I could talk about my experiences with food. I wanted to, because I was an outsider, I wanted to make sure everyone else had access to the same experience um, that was afforded to the uber rich. So I found ways to say, hey, we're not gonna talk about the $100 menus. Let's just go in for an appetizer. Let's find a way to make this accessible for the, the $20 crab. And so in Miami, there's this idea of the red velvet rope that you have to be you know, fancy enough and to, to get in. We said we are the velvet rope and we're opening it. And so by, by changing the content or pivoting the content to come from a way of accessibility, I think that immediately began to even the playing field because it hadn't been done before and you couldn't argue that it was a great, a great way to approach it. And it was on a level that I think um, 
it was, you couldn't, you couldn't argue with it. You know, it wasn't going to be wrong. We're going to be talking about the experience in food and not the technical aspects of food. And I think it was very well received. Um, added to my question, how have you found your voice in content creation and writing that is unique to you? Hmm. That is, when I started out, one of the techniques I used to do was I used to walk around with a recorder. Then it became my iPhone. But I would literally record every single one of my conversations on memo. Sometimes I was speaking with um, friends and I would say, hey, I'm going to record this conversation. If that's okay with you, make sure you ask. Um, and the whole point of that was I wanted to hear how I sound. I wanted to hear my, my, my cadence and try to find a way to bring that into my writing. And that's a technique that I, I still use today, um, and, you know, to, to learn how you speak it and then try to figure out how to translate that into your writing. That really helps for me. And I have a friend, um, I, I don't think she'll mind if I say her name. She's a, a, a YouTube celebrity, um, Francesca Lay, I think that's her name. She also used to do the same thing. She used to record all of her conversations. And so we grew up together and um, she's always had the dream to, to be where she's at. And so I, 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 it, it's a good technique that I think a lot of people might be using. Um, how to build your brand in order to pivot throughout the industry in your career? Erin, that's a great question. Build your brand by just simply doing it. Start where you are. I never built a brand understanding the power behind it because remember, I was, it was always my side hustle. My side hustle, surprisingly, was the one that always gave me that promotion. Um, it gave me an edge. And so I... Just always, always be, I think, kind of diversify your career portfolio in a sense. I don't think, um, I think a lot of times people really focus on the brand, building your brand, especially now because of Instagram, there's so much um, pressure to do that. But focus, when you have a side hustle, focus on doing it correctly. When you're in your company, you have so many deadlines. You have things you need to do. Hit that mark, hit that mark, meet that deadline. So when you're doing it on your own terms, you have the convenience to sit back, relax, and just get it right. So that is a good way of thinking of it. Don't worry about the brand. Worry about learning the right techniques and building the right relationships. So how can NYT Cooking and Bon Appetit do better? Um, how can we push, this is the last question, how can we push large publications to adopt some of your strategies from Island and Spice? Um, you know, I do think we need a complete regime change at a lot of these companies. Um, NYT Cooking is doing um, what they can. They were the ones who actually, Sam Sifton was the person who said, Rochelle, I want you to cover Caribbean food for us. Um, and I was just like, what does that mean? And I did research and this is, this is the, the, the result of that, um, I think it's really important for readers out there to also hold the, uh, the editors and the companies that be accountable. Um, support black owned businesses and uh, hold people accountable, ask questions. You guys are media folks, do it. Do it. I think it's up on all of us to do that. So anyways, thank you so much for being here. It's been wonderful. I could talk to you guys for hours. I want to hear more questions. <laughs> oh, we loved your chat. Thank you so much, Rochelle. That was so interesting to learn more about why food journalism is breaking news. It really is. It touches so many parts of our culture and our history and our lives. And we love learning your story, too. It's just so such a great. Yeah, you know, we wish we could spend more time with you. Too mm -hmm. bad. But we hope you'll stick around. We are doing networking in a little bit. Okay. Oh, so we're here. very excited to. We can't. We know how to. We know how to private message you in the in the app and hop in too. So we'll definitely find ways to to pull you around. Pull you aside. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, everybody.